you look out the window and watch the climate change happen. I think what impressed me the most actually was happening here in this town. Usually you would look out and see the, the big um, iceberg floating by and the, the tip of the iceberg would be uh, visible uh, above the mountains. And, and someday I looked out and I couldn't see any, any tip of icebergs. So that was kind of shaking me very, very dramatically and I was feeling like, you know, watching a mountain, it always stays there. It's, uh, I felt the same way about the icebergs, that uh, there was something happening which I didn't imagine would, would ever occur. I think Alulasat is one of the most dramatic places in Greenland to see climate change because it has one of the largest glaciers in Alulasat Ice Fjord, and it has some of the biggest changes. Um, you know, that, that band of clean, exposed bedrock that I was talking about, it's really wide. It's huge in Alulasat. And you can see the glacier flowing into the sea and just how high the stresses are and the ice dynamics causing all those cracks in the icebergs flowing in the ocean. It's a very dramatic setting. Climate change is not uniform around the world, of course. Uh, generally, there's more warming on land than over water, and generally there's also more warming at higher latitudes than around the equator. So places in the Arctic that have land have much higher warming than the global average. So what we see happening in Greenland is repeated across all the Arctic nations to some degree. But of course, Greenland has the most ice, and it presents the biggest sea level rise threat, which is why it gets the most attention. But one thing is for certain, Greenland is losing ice. The world's sea levels are rising. If Greenland ice melts away totally, that's seven meters. 40%, 40% of all people live at the coast because they live in cities with harbors, where ships are coming in. And if you get two, three meter rise, it's going to be so terrible. From your outstanding research, what are the most insights to tell the world to care about climate crisis? So I think when you go to the Greenland ice sheet today and you get close to the ice sheet, you'll notice that you know, the tundra is dark and covered with plants all around the ice sheet except in this little band where you can see where the ice has retreated since the Little Ice Age, about the year 1900. And there you see that the rock is, has no vegetation, it's relatively bright, freshly exposed, there's still dust on it from the ice sheet retreating. And that trim line, as we call it, or the bathtub ring showing how the ice has retreated, you can see that getting bigger every year. And you will go to places where you know that the ice was 100 meters thicker 60 years ago, and you go there today and you see the change with your own eyes. Uh, you go to places where you know that they uh, drove through and surveyed stakes 60 years ago, and you go there today and you just see massive crevasse fields that have been exposed as the ice flow is changing. So the, the changes are quite shocking and striking if you know what to look for. I think for us, you know, if you go to the ice fjord here in Iludiset, you will see how quickly the ice is actually um, moving uh, away from the coastline. Uh, and, and you see that on the vegetation not being there. So it's very, very visible proof that we have here. So when you stand on the fjord wall and you watch those icebergs slowly going into the ocean, you're watching about 1% of the global sea level rise contribution leaving Greenland and going into the ocean. It's one of the biggest point sources of ice loss from the ice sheet today. Right now the ice sheet is losing about 
10,000 tons of ice per second every minute of every day of every year. That's on average. That's an inconceivably large number. It's, it's so huge. And I think that is what's difficult for people to understand is just how big the numbers are, how big the forces involved are.我現在站的位置呢應該大家會有感受你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看到这些大型的冰块，然后你看
The melting of the glaciers is anticipated to cause a 7 meter sea level rise. I'm sure one can do the math, but this scenario paints a bleak future for a country like the Marshall Islands and may I add other low lying atolls. We cannot get around that. We can come up with a lot of other factors that might influence it, but our carbon footprint is the key factor in this aspect. Because we don't get around the fact that it is our carbon emissions that are the key factor in this. There is some uh, consensus that a good amount of carbon dioxide to have in the atmosphere would be around 350 parts per million, which would be great, we'd have a stable climate, what we are used to historically. I was born when it was 340 parts per million. Now, some days it gets up to about 410. So we're way past the 350 parts per million threshold. And we see in the ice cores that climate change can happen like this. So, the problem now is that we see a higher level of methane and carbon dioxide than in the last one million years. And we know from physics that if you introduce methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you increase the greenhouse effect. And that means the Earth will get warmer. Uh, you then have uh, some uh, obvious uh, evidence about uh, the research uh, to see because the, the, human reason act, yeah, the, the reason is from the human activities. The IPCC assessment reports have done a really good job of partitioning the radiative forcings of each of those elements to show beyond a doubt that it is the increase in carbon that is tipping us towards a warmer planet with warmer atmospheric temperatures, but also, and very especially, warmer ocean temperatures. And we talk a lot about atmospheric temperatures, but really about 90% of this extra energy we're trapping in the planet is now in the oceans. That People don't think about that a lot in day-to-day -day life, but when you think of the Greenland ice sheet and it has those glaciers that dip their toes in the ocean, as warmer water starts to come into those fjords, a little sat fjord included, as you will see, it really starts to melt and destabilize those glacier toes and cause them to uh, flow out faster. So in Greenland, Yes, the atmospheric warming is a huge driver uh, of the increased surface melt, and that's a huge issue. But we also have warming from below in the ocean that's destabilizing the tidewater glaciers. So Greenland reflects both of these processes today. I'm Bin 这两天呢
this this winter, the winter of 2022, was was one of the top winters. Oh, yeah, yeah. But okay. but uh, and and this winter, for example, we had to take the boats out for three months. They were on shore for three months. Last year, we had the boats in all year, no ice. So that's that's kind of how you know. It's yeah. it's difficult to to plan ahead because you don't know what kind of winter you're going to get. Like our forefathers adapted a lot to the weather, like where are they going hunting, where are they catching fish, and when are they going through the year, and when are they catching these animals. But now it's very, uh, even though it's season based, it's very difficult sometimes to go out and catch. So The sea is here, it's yes. frozen to ice. Frozen to ice. Yeah, then we go out and fishing on the ice. Yes. And now we can not go on the ice, we cannot use it okay. anymore. But I think the climates have been changing a lot, you, knew, you know about that. Yeah, when I was yeah. a kid here, I had uh, snow, uh, so much snow in, in wow. the city, yeah. Yeah, um, the yeah, and then we had a lot of years without that much snow. But the few, uh, two years, uh, the last two years, we actually have had a lot of snow again. So in uh, several years, the glacier and the inland ice has been melting a lot and it has affected the local people as well because during winter, locals, uh, they do uh, sled dogs and um, they go fishing to the inland ice and then they can also see that the ice, it has been melting and it has um, visibly been decreasing. You can see the affected area here goes down. You can see also the see the tops over there, but we have to go over here. You can see the top up there, it goes down also. It used to be flat. It, it's mel it melted and uh, yeah, and people cannot live here anymore because of, uh, it's unstable. Every time I notice that at 12 o'clock lunchtime, the island is getting hotter and hotter by the day. It has gotten like hotter. Yeah. For sure. Ever since I was, when I was little, yeah, I wasn't, I wouldn't think it was that hot, but now it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even want to go outside. Throughout the seasonal calendar, you'd expect rain on some seasons, but now it's, it seems like it's gone over on its head. We're seeing extensive droughts. Um, like right now, we're not supposed to be seeing rain um, as we've seen in the, uh, the past weeks. So climate change has altered uh, um, very lively. Uh, growing up in the Marshall Island, uh, I've been observing a lot of uh, problem with sea level rising. Every year, you can, you can uh, obviously see that the, the, the seas are rising higher and higher, and it's corroding our land. I get to experience seeing um, the land, my backyard, being eroded firsthand. The more the sea level rises, the, the less land we get because it's slowly drifting us away. Uh, it's affecting our agriculture. Can't plant some, uh, anywhere near seawater because the plants are going to die and frequent inundation of water and selling it, you know, uh, salt uh, getting into our crops, you know. Uh, so basically our livelihood uh, is affected uh, from the climate change. The things that have used to happen at about February, once a year, uh, it's happening almost every other month. Inundation of water into the, in, into the land, inland water inundating. The water is now next to the
这个地方的飞机场，我来看到我吓一跳啊，因为你看这里哦，是不是柏油路的机场啊？刚降落的时候呢，其实有些海水都已经打上来了，侵蚀它的海岸线呢，非常的严重。我们刚刚沿路看到很多的树啊，都已经往海岸边那边倒下去了啊。潮汐的时候呢，这个飞这条飞机跑道呢就不见了，就到海底下去了啊，造他们生活居民上的影响啊，非常的大。Like we did over there, we bring in sand, rocks, and gravel, and yeah, and build seawalls. But in, in, we can't afford to build seawalls. Local government budget doesn't have the money. But I don't think it will be my generation. Maybe the next year generation or so. Whoever is in the government would have to decide which islands to save and which islands to let go. Because you can't afford. To build sea walls around all the island. As much as possible, we're using uh, as we can our Greenlandic uh, products like uh, herbs, and as well as uh, from all the local hunters and local fishermen. So we're purchasing that from local fishermen. Um, yeah. Why do you think is it related to climate change? Um, uh, well, personally, I, I haven't really felt any uh, effect, um, um, but I actually, what I see is... And maybe it's because of climate change, I don't know. But uh, the climate change could also be positive, so we could grow another species of vegetables. Dumb. <laughs> no, no. But but he know this kind of thing, right? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, oh. The 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 habits. It's not the, about climbing. Uh, forget all about climbing because it's it's small peaks. Uh, we here that the inlet night is melting. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, we, can, uh, we can feel the warm, but not such the may, uh, amounts of warm, warmth. It's, uh, it's uh, particles uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the... Uh, uh... So climate change is always a bad thing? No. No. In South Greenland it's good because we are growing and the culture is getting warmer down there. And, uh, and uh, b b sheep farmers are using that. This is good for us. We like that it's getting warmer. And I can see that. I can see why they would want it to be warmer. Some of them said that. Not all of them, but I think there was a few where they said it's actually good that they became, it's getting warmer and that they're welcoming some of the changes. But, you know, What's good for them is devastating for us. What might seem positive, getting warmer, not being as cold, is actually going to impact our entire livelihoods. And so um, I guess that's something that I hope can be nailed even further. Before we didn't really, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of awareness about, about uh, climate change. And our biggest fear is because these islands are low-lying atolls we're probably two meters above sea level because we're also seeing that some of the water lenses have become contaminated with, with salt water, seawater rising. And uh, as a result, it's affecting our local crops, breadfruit, our bananas, uh, the food that we, we eat locally. People say uh, uh, from Greenland also have the bad part of, about the, uh, climate change and much more maybe the good part, the positive part about uh, the, to the Grand Atlantic. So what's your opinion about that? I know the position, especially further south or the very south of Greenland, that farmers would claim that uh, the, the crops are, are growing faster, they get more to feed the animals with, uh, with grass and, and stuff like that. But it, it seems like uh, it's, it's like peeing in your pants, <laughs> that, that it warms a little, for, a little, for a little while and then it gets cold again. It's, uh, it's hard for me to, to pinpoint any positive sides of, 
of climate change because, uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's affecting every way. And it, in the end, it, it threatens, uh, like, uh, uh, who would we be in the future? If, if not, we are able to hunt. That's what we live off. We, we live off fishing. Uh, we live by the ice, with the ice. Um, if it disappears totally, who are we then? I think most people in Greenland, most Greenlanders, they prefer the, they prefer the climate as it was. The history of the country is very cold and the history of the indigenous people here are hunting for seals, hunting for even for polar bear, walrus, whales. And I think most people would like to continue that lifestyle. They view it as the, their culture and something they value, they find very valuable. So most people know about climate change? Some of them are, are I'm really unsure whether we're going to lose the country. Some of them believe that God had created this country, this island, and made the people live on it. There's no way God can take it away from them. Some, that's what some people think. But most of them are aware of climate change. We buried our loved ones in a land where we believe they'll be rest forever and not to be worried about them anymore. The water come and take them away. So that's affecting us psychologically as well. God told us that they would, he would protect us, that he would send that one flood and that there wouldn't be another crisis. And if it, it's in God's hands, that can be your belief and that makes sense. And we're not disputing any of that, but it's better to be prepared just in case. You know, God helps those who help themselves. Um, God entrusted us to take care of this planet and this earth. And so that's a lot of what we've been offering as, you know, an alternative for how and why the Marshall Islands should adapt, how and why we should be invested in the climate crisis and responding to it. could be horse tail, could be problematic because it has quite long roots. So if they sort of grow down into the archaeological layers, they start to yeah, destroy the artifacts, but also just like move the soil around uh, so we don't have a structural layer anymore. So that could also be a, a problem for, for archaeological sites that we get more. And that means that all of the the, the human waste, the human activity, the animal bones, the skin, everything that used to be preserved in the cold is now um, slowly disintegrating in the heat. You can end up having like really beautiful plants, but no archaeology left. Because it's, 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 you can, with a glacier, you can see it with your own eyes, it's melting. But here we have things that are hidden beneath the ground. So it's, and that's also our fear that if you have a site and you come back in 20 years, it's just completely gone. I, I don't think it, I don't think it would be a problem for her, us to live here. Um, and also when the ice is disappeared, because we live high, um, our, the sea level, level will get higher, but it will even reach the houses. Um, we don't have houses near to the sea like you have in Europe and the low, uh, 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 the countries are very lower and I think the, uh, they are the first um, first countries who have to face it hard when it comes to the
should open eyes of everybody because this is a global issue. So we're going to get more iceberg coming to the Atlantic. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> What's happening in Greenland affects here, in my own island, in my own country. What's happening in some part of the world affects everyone else. It's not just your, your neighborhood, but it will affect everybody else. We are, for sure, people of the ocean. We have no control over that fact. But now, with climate change, it can be um, one of the things that could potentially destroy everything that's about the Marshall Islands. So. So it just gives me a sense of, you know, what what are what what is the RMI going to do next, and you know, all that ton of water that's going into the ocean, it's coming to us next. So what are we gonna do? If there is something wrong, then we have to move, leave our island. But you know, this is our homeland, and we really love it. We can do nothing. We don't have food to cool. Only few years, right? But small one. About 13 pages. Cannot accommodate all the people here. Take them away when there's something wrong. The ice are melting and the sea is rising. Here in the Marshall Islands, we are already experiencing the effect of climate change. And we are on the front lines of this global crisis. But Marshall Islands, our very life woven into the land. There's a saying in Marshallese that uh, man without a land is no man. And for anybody just to come and say, why don't you just move to another high mountain land? They have no understanding of who we are at Marshallese. It's not that simple as just leave your plan. In Greenland, we can see it spreading in just the last five or ten years. It's becoming more and more common. They suddenly spread very fast. You even see them quite a lot in the city here. And they spread in, in nature quite fast and they can outcompete local species. So um, that is always a danger that you get these invasive species. Fishing is going very well with the increase of, of uh, water temperature, at least for this part of Greenland, yes. For this region, it has meant that the shrimp population out here seems to be increasing. But at some point, when the water becomes too warm out here, the, the shrimp population will then migrate further north. If you suddenly lose those fatty arctic species, that means that uh, species like the humpback whale have to eat a lot more of all organisms that is not as fatty to get the same amount of energy. We are not seeing that, it's not happening yet, but it's just these are potential things that could happen in the future that we see a shift because these Arctic species are moving further away. a huge amount of significant decline in, in the fish. When I was young, we, we could just go out for an hour or two and we'd catch a lot of fish. Nowadays, you gotta go out real far um, and you'd be 
lucky if you catch something within an hour or two. Otherwise, you'll be out there all day long and almost come home with no fish. But nowadays, either you're really good or otherwise you're not getting any, like in the past. Most, most of the times, the fish you catch will be undersized and will not have, um, are still in their juvenile phase. Um, this is something that we face um, given the notion of shifting the base lines. 99% of the Marshall Islands is water. And if the water warms, then sea level will rise. But if it warms up, the fish may not be able to be there. You can't fish. If you can't fish, you can't survive. You might as well have to might fish somewhere else. It's pretty interesting how two places very far from each other, Marshall Islands and Greenland, one is very cold, one is pretty humid, and one is very large and one is very small. They're going through the same problems with climate change and they're both experiencing pretty much the same things. Then. Somewhere it, it, it's getting even colder, uh, somewhere else it's getting warmer, uh, the rain is, is falling more heavily, the storms are stronger, and you know, everything is changing. So it's, it's, it's a global phenomena, uh, but those who are impacted the most is, is those people living in the Arctic area. And I read somewhere recently that uh, the number of sled stalks, for instance, are, have been diminishing uh, like half of the sled dogs. Uh, have, uh, the owners had to, to, to kill them because they couldn't afford to feed them because they cannot go on the sea ice anymore. 昨天晚上到现在哈，雨势真的下得蛮大的哦。呃，我们访问了德国前总理库里克，呃，他告诉我们说，呃，格陵兰呢有这么大的雨势哦，其实是很少见的哦。工作犬呢，呃呃，最近的数量也大量的减少，为什么呢？因为他们已经不需要它了哦，就是呃，就是地面上呢，呃，就是有雪或有冰的时间呢是呃越来越少了，这在冬天。的时间哈，那呃会比较厚，那其他的话其实已经都用不到工作犬来拖东西了，所以呃这个区域的工作犬原本呢听说有呃八千多只哈，那现在呢几乎只剩下三千只左右，那五千只哪里去呢？五千只都安乐死了。那我,我问他们说，那为什么就是要安乐死呢？那当地的呃就是呃居民告诉我们说，因为。呃，数量蛮大的，然后呢，呃，他们未来的生活也没有人可以好好照顾他们了、哦，所以就给他们安乐死。我想气候变迁呢，给我们带来很大的生活上的冲击。呃，也许下一个呃气候难民就是我们。We have about 100 projects per year or something like that coming in and we have about 250, 300 scientists. I started up this project uh, up in Northeast Greenland, I think almost 30 years ago and it's still running and we are still doing very much the same. Where they have been lying there hard working for maybe 12 hours per day out in the field, then they come back with, um, with what you could call a small piece of equation for climate models. So it's a very slow process and we do it because our perception is so much control and we, are, we do not dare to take decisions before we are convinced that we are taking the right decision. And that's why we are modeling and modeling and modeling on and on. If you look Last year, yes. in the August 14th, if you know, they have the post and in uh, the old times about the raining yeah. in the ice, uh, oh, ice yeah. sheet. Yes. Yeah, it's the, you know, in every record, it doesn't seem like uh, the rain on the ice sheet. Yeah. 
That was a very extreme event. We're not used to getting rain on the ice sheet. Everybody was starting to guess that we'd start to get rain on the ice sheet because of climate change and the atmosphere warming and holding more water. So at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland here, we had started to put uh, rain gauges on our weather stations on the ice sheet. Normally they don't have them because there's no rain. But then that event happened and it was very unexpected and we didn't have any rain gauges, for example, at Summit yet because nobody expected there to actually be rain at Summit anytime soon. We thought we probably had many years to roll out the rain gauges. So that one caught us very unaware. Trouble is, the complex system of weather and oceans and mountains and people and everything is so complex, it's very hard to say precisely how this is going to happen. And that is why everybody in the world is using climate models, computer models to, to do. But we can prove from the ice cores that the computer models we use are wrong. Yeah, in certain degrees they are wrong. They are the best we can do, but we can also demonstrate it's not enough. We are still stupid. We are still, uh, you know, there's many things we do not know. And the problem with the computer model is it also contains what we don't know but in a bad way, because that means maybe the result is not completely right. The ice sheet likes it to be cold and frozen all the time. And liquid water is just very corrosive to the ice sheet because it contains a lot of energy. So when there's more liquid water through melt or through rain, it starts to flow into the ice and it heats up the ice. And that can make the ice flow faster, much faster in fact. Um, the viscosity, of ice is very dependent on temperature. If ice warms by 10 degrees Celsius, it can flow 10 times faster for the same driving stress. It's a huge response. So that is the huge concern about rain and melt. If we have more rain, more melt, it can make the ice flow faster into the ocean. And we're not entirely sure how much faster or what the total implication is going to be. And that's always been one of the sources of uncertainty in Greenland sea level predictions, is how sensitive are the ice dynamics to this increasing water input. Generally, our models and our climate models are best at reproducing the average, and extreme events can be challenging. Um, because some of these events that bring rain to Greenland, for example, they're over a very limited space and a very limited time. So you need really high resolution of your models in time and space to capture these processes. You know, we talk about things like atmospheric rivers, um, which is just a bunch of warm water coming from low latitudes up to high latitudes and bringing moisture and heat onto the ice sheet and causing these uh, extreme events. But something like an atmospheric river is a very small scale process at the scale of the whole planet. And these processes are hard to resolve in a climate model. It's important that we don't get distracted by uh, single years or small events. Like one year we might have a very cold year uh, with a lot of sea ice and then it's easy to say that global climate uh, warming uh, is not happening. That keep in mind the facts because they, what we are seeing now is a lot of variability. It doesn't mean that climate change is not happening. It doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening faster than it did 10 years ago. Those of us who study climate change, we have a pretty good, we think we have a pretty good idea of how it's happening and how it's happening faster than politicians are reacting. But an event like that comes and it's happening even faster than I think it should be happening, which makes me a little uh, cautious about where we're going in the future. It's happening faster than we forecast at the moment. So I would say to all the people who are climate skepticists, that if they believe in physics and mathematics, if they believe in two and two make four, and if they believe that certain gases like methane and CO2 actually enhance the greenhouse effect, and the earth will be warmer, 
that's enough for them to be to worry. I think climate researchers in particular are starting to talk about a little bit more about climate anxiety or climate grief yes. when you think about the future. Yes. Just this gloom. It's not joyous work to project the demise of the Greenland Ice Sheet and wondering about what that's going to mean for the world and wondering why nobody seems to care and you scream alone into your pillow or Twitter account and no one cares. <laughs> so I think there is a huge sense of helplessness and I think those of us who have kids are especially um, sensitive to the direction the world is heading, especially with climate change. But at the same time, I have to be a little optimistic that um, at some point we will take action. We've waited too long. The next best time to take action is tomorrow. We'll probably wait longer than that. But at some point, it's going to get so bad with the sea level inundation, with the wildfires, with the crop failures, that people will have to notice and take action. And I'm sure that turning point is coming, and I hope it's sooner rather than later. Because yes, I mean, 2100 sounds far away, but of course, a child born in Denmark today, or Taiwan, has a demographic expectation of living beyond 2100. So in some ways, the 2100 cohort has already started to populate the Earth. So it doesn't seem that far away in human time scales. How I feel about this is the, the clock has, has started. And the clock now is going much faster. We're constantly speeding it up. So what we're asking our kids to do is we want them to stop the clock. We have to stop it now. Because by the time it gets to them, the clock will be way too fast. They won't have the time left to make a difference. We have the time now to make a difference, they won't. So I hope we actually do something so our future generations can walk on this beautiful glacier again. Less sea ice, more sea ice, warmer, colder, all these extremes. And we have to deal with this. And, and it's not, I'm not an alarmist generally that, that, uh, that say that we have to panic because generally panicking about things isn't constructive. We need to find constructive long-term solutions to this. The world will not end. Yeah. If we get climate change, it will be a new situation. Yeah. But we will not all die and the earth will not end. It will just be another one. Yeah. And it's very important that the young people do not panic and say, oh, now everything stops. No, we have to take the challenge to think, to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. And to cut back on emissions in a sensible way. Yes. But take it easy. Don't panic. Don't panic. And the last three IPCC reports have been pretty conclusive in saying it's CO2, we need to lower CO2, it's CO2, we need to lower CO2, it's CO2, we need to lower CO2. I don't think writing more scientific papers is the best way to address this problem. You could hire a thousand glaciologists and the ice sheet will still melt at the same rate. All we can do is diagnose the scale of the problem. So I think the most important task facing us right now on the climate action is educating people and educating the people in charge or educating the people who aren't in charge to tell the people who are in charge what to do. Trying to wrap that up for people in a way that they can digest in between the other things they have going on in their lives. I mean, looking after the kids, looking after the parents, doing their job at work, maybe having a hobby, seeing their friends, and then caring for climate 1%, 2%, maybe 5% of their time. My message is very simple. Please, please, please stop burning fossil fuels and go on renewables. Wind, solar, hydropower, whatever. That would be so lovely. 
we can all, all, always do something individually. We don't have to wait for others to do so or tell us to do. And I think it's very important that we all think that um, we can start today. We don't have to wait. So I think focus should should be uh, be replacing fossil fuel on on very large volume cons consumers like like power plants or, or production facilities in general. Our neighbors are burning, we are drowning, so please be more thoughtful of your fossil fuel consumption and um, commute to work by, uh, by um, public transport at least once a week. Uh, that, would be, that would be nice. want to reach out to people to, to let you know, educate them on climate change and to make them understand what is happening when people do, uh, when they do, do their work, they need to explain more thoroughly to people from the Outer Islands. Because most people in the Outer Islands, they don't speak English. Some of what we've also been doing is explaining what fossil fuels are, you know? Translating that into Marshallese is extremely difficult. What are fossil fuels? What are carbon emissions? We're having to create new language to describe the climate crisis. And, you know, a lot of times when we bring up the concept of climate change, they understand what it is. They know what climate change is, but they don't necessarily understand what causes it. And so there's a lot of misinformation about who causes climate change? Because then what we get a lot of um, pushback on is, well, if you're out there telling all these other countries to lower their emissions, what about us? Look at all these cars we're driving. Look at all these boats we have. But what they don't understand is the Marshall Islands uh, contribution to global emissions is just 0.0007% of the world's global emissions. That means that's how much the Marshall Islands contributes to all of the emissions in the world. And so even if we became the most renewable energy island on the planet, the island would still go underwater. And so some of the education we've had to do is to teach people that actually international organizing and international advocacy is necessary for the climate crisis, for the Marshallese people. We have to keep telling the world our story and we have to keep telling what's at stake. I would love to say that we would love to see more education about the, the climate changes and more connection between the different countries, generally in all of the countries, about the um, climate change that is happening now. Because after all, climate change is under children's rights. Every child has the right to live in good conditions. I have um and, and quite big workshops where I have had all from uh, local hunters to, uh, you, 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 you know, and also representatives from uh, the scientific community, and then all the relevant stakeholders, both national and international stakeholders, in relation to these issues, simply to discuss what are the important issues and how can we solve them together. I, I don't want to stimulate uh, ideas, I want to um, facilitate the process of, uh, of uh, getting the ideas uh, and, and, and I think that's one of the things that I can actually, that uh, I can make people with very different backgrounds uh, cooperate uh, and that's maybe my, my best quality. It's useful to think of three possible futures, the low emissions future or Paris Agreement a middle of the road, and then a high emissions. And right now we're on the high emissions trajectory, which some people call Mad Max world. It is low technology, low cooperation. It's not a good place. It ends up in resource scarcity and a very poor climate, like the movie Mad Max. At the very far other end is the, the low emissions pathway, which would be Paris Agreement. And some people call that Star Trek world where it's like high technology and high cooperation. And then somewhere in the middle is maybe this third road, which is something like what Denmark has today, a sort of ecotopia, where we have medium technology, medium cooperation, but we all have relatively smaller carbon footprints. And 
you know, trying to explain that range of possibilities to the average person and why we should be so afraid to avoid the high emissions scenario, that's a huge challenge because it's not a very positive message. Ziedon 使得这里的再生能源使用率超过了百分之六十。孩子们能在夏季的西边开心玩水，变暖的洋流带来了丰富的渔业资源。从冰层中裸露的土地，有着更多的可供畜牧耕种的农业发展机会。我大胆地预言
getting attention on climate change because there's so many other things happening in the media landscape, rightfully so. When the last AR6 assessment had its final release, it was 10 days before Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. And so, you know, you have this, you have this process, it takes many years, thousands of scientists to try to produce a state-of-the-art assessment on global climate. This is the climate roar. This is the event. Everybody should focus on this. And then like 10 days later, Will Smith slaps Chris Rock and the whole media moves onwards. And so that is the sort of thing that we need to think about how to stay socially relevant as climate scientists. We need to understand that we also have an obligation to put our knowledge and our uh, insights out into formats that are accessible for the general public and not just feeding up into assessment reports for IPCC. And, you know, engaging more with like what you're doing, which is a documentary to communicate climate change and climate change implications to a wider cross section, that will probably be more impactful at the end of the day than me producing another 20-page PDF that goes on the website somewhere. The best advice um, I feel I can give to this documentary is to uh, support civil society to become more active in promoting uh, solutions to uh, climate change. And, and, and I think there are two key roles that civil society can play. One is uh, as voters and put pressure on politicians and governments to be more aware of the uh, impacts of climate change and that we need to find solutions very soon to climate change. The, the second is be becoming active consumers and put pressure on business to deliver more green products in line with the, with the net zero targets and also of course products that are green, more green in, to, in totality. And I think that, um, that the, the more you can link uh, what you're doing on spot, on site, different places in the world to the global movements for, for civil society, the more impact the documentary will have. Melting Greenland is a call to action, not just for the next generation, but for all of us now. The effects of climate change are being felt in all corners of the globe every day. Everybody has their part to play in limiting these effects. Governments, businesses and consumers. Businesses need to place sustainability at the heart of their operations. And they need, they need to work with governments to help implement the solutions and stress the urgency of the positive policy changes that are needed. There are some great news stories. For example, wind and solar are now the cheapest form of electricity in many countries around the world. And an increasing number of businesses, for example, the ones that we work with, the RE100, are transitioning to 100% renewable electricity because it makes business sense. But we need to go further and faster, much faster. It's time for everybody to step up and take action. Thank <laughs> you.